Karthik, welcome and so good to see you and thank you for agreeing to do this. I know how super busy you are. Karthik Satyanarayan is the founder and CEO of Wildlife SOS and one of my personal um, heroes where wildlife conservation is concerned. So really delighted to have him here. Karthik, over to you. Tell us about yourself, your life and your work, please. Latika, thank you so much for having me. And uh, similarly, uh, I think you are, you know, someone that I hold in great esteem. You are such an inspiration. And, uh, you know, I, I think we've had many a conversation together where we've been able to laugh and, and enjoy ourselves. So thank you again. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I created Wildlife SOS in 1995 with a co-founder called Gita Seshimani. And uh, when we started our work in 1995, the focus at that point of time was to resolve a, a huge, um, you know, wildlife crime problem that went on across India, the dancing bears, and where sloth bears were being uh, exploited in an unsustainable manner. But moving on from that point, you know, we today work with leopards, tigers, you know, um, a lot of cat issues as well as enforcement with anti-poaching work and stuff like that. Today's talk is going to be primarily about big cats and what we do with what we do to try and help big cat conservation. But at the same time, I will also start by introducing you to what we've done with Wildlife SOS and a little bit of an introduction to the work of Wildlife SOS. These pictures that you see uh, in the PowerPoint presentation are two of my favorite pictures. Um, that's a le leopard that is currently living in one of our rescue centers. We, this leopard was rescued from a severe human um, wildlife conflict situation. And the tiger as well was rescued from a poacher's trap. So uh, both of these are animals that actually live in our facilities currently. All right. So giving you guys a little bit of background. These are the sloth bears that I was telling you about. And uh, this sight that you see of this man with this bear is what got us going to try and you know make a difference and create wildlife SOS. So what you see here is a Columbo man with his bear. And uh, this had been a 400 year old practice across India. And as you know, time moved on, it became less of a practice for the harem of the Mughal emperors and it became more like a side cheap roadside trick and entertainment for tourists. But the ugly truth behind this was that every single bear that these people used was poached from the wild. And the photo you see here now is of a baby bear, barely a few weeks old, stolen from its mother. And what we saw in 1995 was that 1200 bears were used for performances across the street, across India, on the streets. And each of these backups um, was poached from the wild. And clearly uh, the poachers were killing the mothers in order to pull these baby bears. These bears were then sold to this community for, a, you know, for cheap prices. And about 200 backups were removed each year from the forest. And that was um, what we felt was going to become a problem because it was unsustainable completely. The fact that so many mother bears were being killed and baby bears were being removed every year. And 50% of these cubs that were being trafficked illegally were all getting killed because of the, uh, the stress of trafficking, separation from the mother and things like that. But all of this information we found through our undercover work. So there was a awful lot of investigation, going undercover, gathering all this intel, etc. Which helped us find out what the truth was behind this problem. But then, um, Wildlife Service had to kind of jump in and, and make a difference to try and solve this problem. And the first thing we did was, uh, while we, you know, we started working with the community, but parallelly we also started a lot of anti-poaching efforts to start working with the enforcement agencies, as well as with the communities, and we started gathering this intelligence 
about the movement of these backups, movement of poachers and traffickers, and then sharing that with enforcement agencies that included the police, forest department, and the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. And what you see here is a rare photograph of a smiling policeman. Uh, and uh, that's it's not very common that they get to smile because they have a, a lot, they have to deal with a lot of blood and gore usually. But I am always happy when I see them smile because they've been able to change the life of, of an animal. And I think it creates positive moments for enforcement agencies. Now, going to the community, you know, this uh, image that you see of this man walking with a bear is what this community has gone through for hundreds of years. And this is a Kalandar man with his bear, and that's how he earns, he used to earn his livelihood. And what the image that you see next to it is the photo of his family, his wife and his four children, three you can see inside and there's a I think five children two more outside of the frame and that's exactly how they live you know just a bamboo a couple of bamboo sticks and a piece of tarpaulin and so they had a bad deal they had no education no health care no toilets no drinking water that woman would have to walk with those children for five miles to get a pot of water and so we realized that you know we had to try and make a difference for the community in order to make bring about a change for the animals as well and so we thought about bringing a sustainable solution to bring uh, an end to this illegal practice of uh, bear trafficking so we started the more intelligent species of the Kalandar community the women they were smarter they didn't attack us they didn't chase us and they were willing to learn because they wanted a better future for the children so we started training them and um, sustainable alternatives like carpet weaving tailoring embroidery things like that and that really started empowering the women in the community so they could then provide for their children without having to depend only on the uh, begging uh, with the bears that the men were indulging in. Then we started working with the men and you can see this image on the left side where there's a dancing bear with this man called Amin Saab and that was what he was doing all his life to support himself and his family. But when he surrendered his bear, we helped him with seed funds to get an auto rickshaw or a tuk-tuk. And that was earning him, uh, in, in some cases, almost five times more than what he would earn with a bear. That made it, it made it possible for him to educate his children, stay in one place, not have a nomadic existence like they used to earlier. And that improved the quality of life for his family. Again, getting the children to school was a big challenge. Uh, initially, they just wanted their kids to go out and work and earn money for them. But we were able to get that child that you see in that image dancing a baby bear on the street to school. And we've sent over 7,600 children to school. And I think education is a very powerful tool. The minute you're injected and infected with education, you don't want to be out there on the streets begging. And I think those kids have now, you know, they're going to senior, secondary, uh, and they're following, pursuing um, higher education, which is a real matter of pride for us at Wildlife as well. And uh, you can see, I mean, this is one of my favorite images where I see these kids really happy and, uh, and, and at school because they always dreamt of going to school. They never got the opportunity to go to school because their parents couldn't afford the school fees, the books, the school uniforms, and we were able to support all of that and make that change. Of course, finally, we had to rescue all of these bears. So Wildlife as well as ended up rescuing over 628 bears across India. Each of them was obviously, you know, taken from the wild, but each of them had a, a history of abuse that the, each of them had gone through. And there was a hole through the muzzle where a hot iron poker had been used to make a hole. And then a rope was thrust through it. And so we had to pull the ropes out, sedate the bears, uh, their teeth had been smashed out using metal rods. And we had to subject each of the bears to root canal treatment surgeries. Many of them came in uh, you know, positive for tuberculosis, which they acquired as a result of reverse zoonosis uh, from working with living so close to the community. And this is one of our hospitals. So we created not just for bear rescue centers across India, but we also created hospitals within those centers. And here's an image of Rani Bear, one of our first ever bears, uh, of how she looked when she came in and how she looks today. 
uh, after uh, living with us for many, many years. Parallelly, while we were doing this, we also started getting a lot of intelligence about illegal wildlife trafficking, not just in bears, but pangolins, owls. Uh, and then we started working with poachers and reforming them. So every one of these rescuers on this rapid response unit of wildlife rescuers is a reformed poacher, whether he's holding a nilgai or a python. And that we felt was bringing the circle you know, around and, and bringing it back around full circle. Because we respond to over 6,000 calls for wild animals in distress. And training these people from these communities to value wildlife much more than, you know, seeing them just as, you know, pot, you know, meat for the pot was, uh, was bringing more value to conservation. And that's what we've done to make it more sustainable. Our rapid response units are also um, working constantly. You can see one of our rescuers over here sitting on top of a crocodile because sometimes we work in very prehistoric conditions and we don't have the necessary tools when we are working in the field. So we have to jump on top of a crocodile to hold him down while we are transporting him into a release site or use a milk crate to rescue that leopard cup that you see in the other photo, uh, pulling it out of a deep well before we can reunite it with its mother. So these are some of the situations that we have to deal with as we move forward. Now, um, moving on to our, uh, our presentation where the cats come in. So one of the main things is to teach people how to coexist with leopards and tigers, some of the big cats that get into a lot of conflict with human beings, primarily because they live in a human dominated landscape. And uh, this is a challenge that we, we have. And this is one of uh, one of my favorite leopards at the Leopard Rescue Center that Wildlife Officers runs in Maharashtra, where we have over 35 leopards in our care currently. The biggest challenge that we face is that people don't understand leopards. Although I think all of our fathers and forefathers who lived in that landscape understood leopards and appreciated the fact that even when these animals inherited the earth before us, they gave us space and we've got to be similarly proactive in giving them space and sharing our land with them. But I think that value no longer exists currently. As you can see in this photograph, you know, people are attacking this leopard and all the leopard is trying to do is get away from them, escape from them and get out of being cornered. So there is a real need for people to understand leopards and the ecological behavior. There is also you know, a real urgent need for people to understand how to avoid leopards. Avoidance behavior is pretty easy, but unfortunately, I think people don't think through it. When they panic, the first thing they do is either run or they take a stick and start attacking the animal back. And you know, when, when you're living in a human dominated landscape with these animals, we have to learn to coexist with them in peace. The level of intolerance that is exhibited towards leopards is really uh, extremely high. And that's something we're hoping to address. Uh, here is another uh, example of the kind of conflict that goes on all the time. What you see here is a deep well. It's usually 40 to 50 feet deep. And there are thousands of uncovered wells, open wells as we call them across India and uh, we did a survey and just in a couple of districts there were over 9,000 wells in Maharashtra. So you can imagine, I mean we're looking at probably thousands and thousands of wells across India that probably kill wildlife but also are a danger to human beings because they have no barrier around them and you know they, they result in the death of many many animals. But Primarily, a lot of leopards fall into these wells and we have to, what you see here, again, you know, like I said, we work in very basic circumstances. So we have lowered, there are those six ropes that are going down to lower a cage. And then there's a leopard at the bottom that's trying to get into the cage. And usually we throw in a ladder and help the leopard stay afloat so it doesn't get exhausted and drown. And then it gets inside. Then once it's pulled out, you know, our team uh, starts providing it medication. They do a physical check. What you see here is our veterinary team as a leopard rescue center doing a check before we 
release the leopard back in the wild or keep it for treatment before it is then released eventually. But the role that I feel is most important that our team is able to play is to educate the local communities. And what you see here is our team talking to the local communities and educating them about the importance of not panicking and the importance of avoidance behavior and how they could all go to their fields and function without the fear of leopards, but at the same time, keeping themselves safe and keeping their livestock and their animals safe and their families. And this is something which I think is the need of the hour today in India. We also do a lot of training uh, courses and uh, training sessions for forest department in terms of the frontline staff learning how to react and respond if there is an issue, whether it's a trapped animal, a cornered leopard, a tiger, or um, you know a situation where there's already conflict and it needs a dresser. One of the things that makes me very happy and I think is also an important aspect is to ensure that leopards don't end up in captivity. So the big problem that we have today is that you know we live in a human dominated landscape. A lot of forest lands are now turned into cultivation areas and is dominated by sugarcane fields. Leopards follow wild boar and other game and end up in sugarcane fields expecting to find game and live a sheltered life over there. Their habitat has changed and they're using sugarcane as their hiding areas. So they litter their cubs over there as well. And this is a process that we've learned very often when a farmer is harvesting his crop, he finds, comes upon a couple of leopard cubs, he usually picks them up, gives them to the forest department and then those cubs were ending up in captivity for the rest of their lives. That's something we wanted to address and make sure that these cubs went back to their mothers so they could function as wild leopards and not end up in captivity. And so one of the things that we do is this process where you're seeing, this is a photograph taken uh, using an infrared camera at night when it's pitch dark. And we've got a box over here which contains the leopard cubs, two leopard cubs that the mother abandoned in a field because she found people harvesting the sugarcane. She was disturbed. So she went away. And we then set up this whole structure at night, usually the same day. And sometimes it goes on for several days until we, the mother comes back. And here is a little video. You can see the leopard mother has come back and she's picked up one cup. There's another cup in the box. You can see the silhouette of it behind. And she picks the cups up and goes back one after the other. And so we have successfully returned these cups back to the mother and ensured that they never have to live in captivity all their lives. We've reunited over 60 cups in this manner. And this is this has worked successfully. Moving on to tiger conservation, we follow a similar process. Again, the big problem is that people are getting into conflicts with the big cats. And one of the reasons is that, you know, we are losing their habitat and the habitat is getting modified into agriculture. And there's a lot of habitat fragmentation, uh, encroachment, as well as disturbance. So they, they end up having to come closer to human habitation. Uh, wildlife is run the Tiger Rescue Center in Bangalore in partnership with Born Free Foundation from the UK and the Forest Department of Karnataka. And uh, we provide treatment and care for rescued tigers. Primarily, those, are, those that are rescued from poachers. In this particular case, this is a tiger that was rescued from a jaw trap. And uh, here is a photo of jaw traps on the left that you can see. These cost nothing to make. They, use, they are created using uh, discarded automobile spare parts and on the right you see a tiger that was killed by a jaw trap and these are the kind of situations that we have to deal with and we rescue such tigers and once they're with us we then care for them and this tiger was not so lucky uh, it it was killed bludgeoned to death and skinned and again uh, wildlife SOS uh, intelligence a unit was able to gather the intelligence, intercept these people, but working in collaboration with enforcement agencies, we were able to arrest these people who are smuggling not just a whole tiger skin, but a bunch of bones. It was a complete skeleton. And uh, we've been able to successfully not just send these guys to jail, but also assist the enforcement authorities with prosecution support. 
And this is something that's really important for the cat conservation in India. This is a, an image that does make me smile. This tiger was not as unlucky as the earlier one. It survived the jaw trap, but now live, but is because the leg was amputated, it wasn't able to be released in the wild. So it lives on at the rescue center that we have. But um, you know, our team works very hard to give it a lot of enrichment and keep it uh, in a new forested condition in, um, in as wild uh, a habitat as possible inside very large enclosures. Again, you know, uh, our anti-poaching unit, which is called Forest Watch, plays a very important role in big cat conservation. Again, here you can see four poachers who were arrested by the forest department and the police based on intelligence passed on by wildlife as well to ensure that these people are punished and the word gets out that big cats are to be protected and not persecuted in this manner. There's another leopard skin that we, we confiscated not so long ago. Uh, right on the border of Delhi, can you imagine? Very close by. Uh, again, um, while we are working with um, enforcement agencies, we come upon a lot of information about wild animals being trafficked, and that includes snakes, turtles. Uh, we even got this very interesting case where there were two saltwater crocodiles and a bunch of ball pythons that were being trafficked if you please, using the postal system. So they would come in many boxes and it would be marked, uh, you know, uh, powdered chili powder or dry chilies or something like that. And it would be, it would, there would be a fake address on it and it would come get delivered over there. And uh, the postal office contacted our team and said, there's this box that is moving. So can you please send someone down? So we sent a team down there to check on it and we found that there were cro live crocodiles inside the post bag. So, I mean, smugglers may go to any extent. So it's really important that we understand that, you know, illegal wildlife trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry and we've got to do everything we can to, to stem it and stop it. Uh, the important thing that I also wanted to share is that we encourage a lot of volunteers to work with wildlife SOS. So here are volunteers helping us prepare feed for our rescued animals that live at our centers. And that includes, you know, not just big cats, but also bears, elephants, uh, all kinds of animals, birds, etc. But it also gives volunteers an opportunity to come and work shoulder to shoulder with our team. And all they need to do is email us at volunteer at wildlifeassoos.org if they want information on how to come and volunteer with us. And there's one other thing that we do. We also work with elephants. And uh, we've been constantly trying to uh, get people to understand the importance of responsible tourism and being responsible tourists when you go to a country like India. And as you know, elephants in India have a bad deal. They get exploited severely and they suffer a lot of abuse. So we always encourage people to go to refuse2ride.org, which is a resource website, and educate themselves about what is used as a training method for elephants so they can be driven by tourists. And it's really important that everybody sees that before they get on top of an elephant. And um, well, that's it. You know, that, that was my presentation on, on the work that we do to protect big cats and other animals. And if anybody needs more information, they're welcome to go to our website, which is wildlifeassoes.org. They can also go to our social media page, Facebook, which is Wildlife Assoes India. And they're free to email me on uh, Karthik at wildlifeassoes.org. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. So just just going to what you were talking about and the fact that you have, um, you said 35 big cats just in, in one center. Um, Kartik, tell us what is involved in looking after 35 cats for the rest of their lives on a daily basis. What is it that you do? I think people really need to understand this. Looking after 35 big cats on a daily basis is no easy feat, I can tell you that. It requires a lot of resources. You need to follow very strict safety protocols because these some of these animals have been monitored, some of them have been cornered uh, and have had a bad experience with human beings. Uh, so they are scared and they don't want you know really to to have anyone in their face. So it requires us to be very patient. It requires us to have a team. We have a team of about 15 people 
just looking after the leopards, so including their feed, the monitoring. We do a lot of uh, enrichment in terms of scent because big cats can get bored, just like us human beings during the lockdown. You know, we need to ensure that they have uh, some excitement during the day, and they have, you know, they we arouse their senses by you know putting in different scents, uh, throwing in different things for them to play with, creating enrichment structures that they can climb on and stuff like that. So uh, it keeps our team really, really busy, but also our rapid response unit has to be always ready to get into the Jeep and drive out if they get a call about an animal in distress. And you know, since you've been talking about this, I also must use the opportunity to mention that recently we've had a six part uh, episode series made about the work that we do at Wildlife was including the work of the big cats. Uh, on Matthew Wild, and it's called India's Jungle Heroes. It's currently streaming on Hotstar across India, but otherwise, uh, I think it's aired on Matthew Wild, and it, it actually shows people what it takes to care for these big cats on a daily basis. And uh, I'm constantly, you know, concerned about these big cats because we've got to make sure that they have a, a decent quality of life because we can never put some of these cats back in the wild. And we need to replicate what the wild offers, what these forests offer to these animals inside their large enclosures. So the goal is to try and give them a large enclosure and we're constantly looking for you know, people to sponsor and donate the material so we can make these animals large enclosures and then you know, uh, make sure that we can give them you know, a good quality of life and keep them in good health. Okay, so um, from that, um, another thing that has been in the papers a lot is this whole problem in Maharashtra uh, with all the conflict between tigers and humans and uh, people from the forest department now talking about the fact that they want to remove 50 plus tigers uh, from where they live presently. Um, and translocate them uh, with no mention of where they're going to translocate them or uh, and they're talking about sterilizing them now do you think these are real solutions do you think this will have a long-term impact or given today's scenario uh, one of my worries for instance is that if you remove a dominant male tiger from another area it will the territory will fall open and you'll just get a replacement coming in because we have an endless supply from the source. So um, how do you deal with something like this and where do you put 50 tigers? Who would be ready to have 50 tigers in the neighborhood? Um, and how do you actually give a tiger a place that he can call home and not be a trapped animal in a little pen, uh, which is what happens most of the time? In my opinion, Latika, I think, you know, the lesser that we interfere with nature, the mm -hmm. better nature is, you know, and she solves these imbalances very easily on her own mm -hmm. if human beings can stay out of the mix. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I think the reason that, uh, you know, we have some of these situations, these conflict situations is, is you know, uh, because there is human presence and sometimes overwhelming human presence and I think we need to look inside ourselves to find that um, you know that problem and usually that is what is causing the problem and uh, I think translocating big cats is really not a good solution you know to be honest because if you move uh, these big cats I mean there is evidence concrete evidence with radio telemetry and microchipping that has confirmed that big cats will come back even if it's two, three hundred kilometers, they will try their best to come back to their original location where they were taken from. But we've seen that, yeah. And that will cause further problems. You will leave a trail of, of bloodshed on the way back and conflict. Uh, that is one problem. The other problem is, you know, when you remove one animal, it creates a vacuum and another animal is just going to replace it. So you're not really solving the problem, but I think the, the way to solve such problems is to teach people avoidance behavior, combine it with a lot of speedy compensations. You know, if people lose livestock, compensate them adequately, sufficiently, and quickly. So there is no delay. 
that will ensure that farmers do not uh, get tempted to poison tigers or go and try and attack the tiger or trap the tiger or anything like that. Instead, if he loses his livestock, all he has to do is submit a form, get the forest department to come and confirm it, and he gets his compensation. End of story. You know, the, the tiger does not get into conflict, and you know it's only going to be 50. You know, or 60 cattle a year, and the government can easily afford to compensate the uh, farmers for that kind of loss. Okay, so just today um, we were doing another talk with a friend, um, Ali Rashid, who was um, talking about um, conservation tourism, and he actually mentioned that in the city where he lives, Bhopal, um, there was a tiger which had wandered in from uh, probably he suspects from the Ratapani area. or in one of the little forest uh clumps that are around bhopal into his daughter's school in the middle of the day and uh, in another case uh, somebody has a big factory there and there was uh, a tiger in their car park so i mean it's not just cities that we're worried about now it's also urban environments um so when you're dealing with an urban situation which are the bodies that you deal with um you know most of the time to to handle a situation like this and which in an ideal world which departments of the government do you want to get on board with spreading the message about how to live around big cats and teaching people what to do in conflict situations i think working with the forest department the police and the local panchayats would certainly uh, you know help in in spreading the word getting people to be more aware about how to react to these situations and how to uh, learn behavior and to live with big cats and i'm not surprised that these tigers are getting into all these spaces because these places are not are not cities you know to start with they are tiger habitats and these animals have learned that i mean this was their habitat some time ago but you know 5 years ago this was jungle and 5 5 years later it's a car park and a factory and it, it's really not their fault i mean they they have no way to go and we are forcing them to come into conflict with us and to come into urban areas so i think people need to learn to respond quickly not panic if they see a tiger in a school or a car park or a factory they contact the forest department the police move to safety and not uh, you know try to be heroes in any way whatsoever it's it's only when people start trying to confront them or come these big cats that you know there is collateral damage and we can easily avoid that by just being responsible around these big cats okay so also to understand um when you when you have all these captive tigers that um well not captive tigers sorry wrong word when you have tigers that you've rescued rescued tigers um how much space do you need um uh, for for a rescue center um how much support do you need um in terms of resources every year or every month uh, what are you looking at and Uh, you know people often ask how can they help do you have programs like adopt an animal how does how does it work in india because we've seen them for zoos abroad but i think people would love to know more about what you do here absolutely uh, latika uh, the wildlife zoo's website has an option where people can uh, select certain uh, big cats and sponsor them so they can actually go in and sponsor a leopard or a tiger at the moment we don't have any tigers for sponsorship but we have leopards certainly and elephants and bears and and other animals uh it does cost a lot i mean the numbers can be staggering uh so you know i i i think we we don't try not to burden people with the large numbers so instead we make it you know um affordable um units so for example i think you know for less than 4000 or 5000 rupees a month they can sponsor a rescue leopard and that's easy for someone to you know come up with and uh, that's what i would request people to come forward and help us with our leopard program is unsponsored it costs us you know a lot of money i think we end up spending you know 7 lakh rupees every year over 50 lakhs i would say uh, on on our work and uh, we would warmly welcome anybody coming forward to sponsor our leopard programs and the rescue leopards in our center 
Okay, so another uh, question uh, which is very important is, um, of course, with this COVID lockdown and the pandemic and, um, you know, all of the resulting um, side effects which we had never envisioned, um, homeless uh, labor heading back across the nation, uh, people needing uh, treatment, needing food, um, a lot of the resources would have been diverted from causes such as yours to all of these immediate pressing human concerns. So um, how does how is that impacted on you and how is that impacting on conservation and uh, working with anti-poaching and trade? Well, the COVID lockdown itself has made it very difficult for our informants to move around and gather intel, but they have been able to get information uh, using phones. And the information is that there's a lot of contraband that is waiting, you know, lying around that we need to work with the forest department and the enforcement agencies to crack down on. So we're just waiting for all of this to kind of settle down so movement can start smoothly and then we can start working closely with the enforcement agencies. Uh, the lockdown itself and the pandemic has impacted us tremendously. It has been quite a challenge for us to administer uh, food material and medical supplies to the various rescue centers that we run. So it has been quite a challenge. We've been requesting everyone to come forward and help us to provide donations. And people can easily do that by just going to wildlifesos.org slash donate online and make contributions to uh, specifically the COVID relief support to wildlife SOS and we're able to provide uh, PPE kits, uh, face shields, san uh, hand sanitizers, etc. and gloves to our staff to keep them safe and these are the same people that work around the clock to keep our animals cared for. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a challenging time and we welcome every bit of support because I think a lot of support has gone away in other directions and it would help us to get, gather every bit of support we can. Every rupee, dollar and pound will help us at this stage. Wonderful. Great. Okay, so t can, you, can you tell us about some of the legal aspects of doing the work that you're doing? I'm, because I know um, from our personal conversations that you've been fighting a lot of battles um, on the legal front as well. So can you talk about that? Because we've had nobody telling us um, anything about that sort of work so far. Uh, well, really, it's, uh, it's quite a challenge because when you start heading down the legal uh, path, that trajectory takes a long time. And you know, it requires a lot of patience. So it can be very frustrating because once we arrest a tiger poacher, for instance, you know, and you send him to jail, and then, of course, you have to constantly keep track because he will keep applying for bail to get out. And then once he's out on bail, he usually disappears. So there's a constant effort from our legal team. We also have a legal team with legal experts, lawyers, as well as uh, enforcement team uh, that assists the various forest departments and the police. So we've got to keep track of what's going on and then uh, keep our finger on the pulse, so to say. Very often they get out on bail and then it takes us months and months to track them back and get them to the court for a hearing because they will then, you know, never come back sometimes. And if they do, again, it can take sometimes up to two years to get conviction. And if the conviction rates uh, in India currently are, are very, very poor, I think they are at an appalling 0.01% for wildlife offenses. And there is a real need to improve that in terms of you know conviction rates for wildlife offenders um so i all i can say is that we do have the best laws in the world the wildlife protection act of 1972 is a unique law and several countries even in the first world don't have such incredible laws but implementing these laws can be challenging due to various reasons you know uh, shortage of manpower in the various state forest departments shortage of manpower with the police inability to you know access these people sometimes uh, you know the challenges in taking these people to court you know arrest regulations bail uh, regulations things like that so i think you know the the frustration and the challenge is in bringing the prosecution process to a close and that is um, quite um, 
quite something. I am completely correct. I also remember um, that you once, uh, on a few occasions, have had to take the evidence into court. And I remember, yes, um, will you tell us about some of those? <laughs> the Wildlife Protection Act expects and mandates that the evidence is also taken to court and tribunals in front of the magistrate. So there have been umpteen occasions when we've had to take live crocodiles and uh, live birds, live snakes into a courtroom. And you can imagine the mayhem that happens if you take a bunch of snakes into a crowded courtroom. So yes, very often we are uh, quite the laughing stock and uh, people uh, ridicule the situation. But that's what the law requires, you know, the Wildlife Protection Act mandates that it's done. Except sometimes in the case of an elephant or something like that, where the magistrate will sometimes visit or come out to check if the elephant is there. But in other cases, you end up having to take the animal on the contraband, which is sealed, into the courtroom. Yeah, it can be better. Better. <laughs> Incredible, yes. Amazing. So tell me, um, you often end up with wild animals that you have rescued um, in an emergency ending up in your house. Tell us some of the extraordinary um, drop-in guests that you have had over the past few years. Well, I can, uh, I can certainly say that uh, there's been quite a challenge in terms of you know handling uh, rescued animals because Delhi uh, where we run our hotline from does not have a rescue center and uh, you know uh, the chief I love is trying his best to make it happen but it's a challenge and sometimes the zoo is unable to take the rescued animal so uh, we end up having to look after those animals right here and I can tell you for a fact that I've had everything from you know baby mealy guy antelope sitting in my living room that I have to bottle feed to uh, baby owls at the moment I think I have three three owls and ibis that I'm having to look after, just waiting for them to grow up so I can release them back. And I've requested uh, the chief I have warning to give us place to, to house these animals and the birds in. But because there's a shortage of place in Delhi, uh, I have to very often do that. And you know, anything from large pythons that I have to use my bathtub to cool them off in, to uh, ibis flamingos, I mean, you name it, I think, uh, you know, we've had to provide emergency care to these animals and sometimes it can be quite a challenge. Amazing, amazing. Well, it's fantastic chatting with you, Karthik, and for, thank you for making all this time for us. And I'm sure that a lot of people are going to read about this and watch this and be in touch with you. Um, so I'm hoping that we can garner more support for the work that you're doing. Um, thank you for having me, Latika. It was a pleasure to speak with you. You too. And um, stay safe, stay well, and continue to be the protector of all things wild in this country. Thank you. Have a great day. Stay you safe. Too. Bye. Bye. are so strong i mean how did it get that huge impala up there but it did pretty amazing